We are here because we are dedicated to helping the entire CrossFit community. Determined to elevate coaches, box owners, athletes, and everything in between, we believe that this mission will begin right here, right now. While this time and this goal begins with you, our hope is that you take this fire ignited within you and weave it into your own life with the same unrelenting passion to give those you have the privilege of coming in contact with the best hour of their day. <clears throat> this is the start to the podcast from now on, everybody. Mm. Now you can go, Jay. How is our audio? Do we have good audio? We don't, you know, if you're listening. My audio is great. Your audio sucks always because you refuse to upgrade your shit. And I got a Yeti mic. If, if you're listening to this episode, hit me up, uh, whether via email, best hour of their day at gmail.com or DM us. Let us know how the audio is. What could be better? Is um, Are we equal? Text him. I'm, I'm going to send everybody your phone number. Text Jay because he likes to be text. It is. I don't mind. I'd rather you don't share my phone number, but I don't mind <laughs> if everybody. No, has- nose hold. Nose hold. Write this down. <laughs> I think it's weird that people will not give out their phone number because it all just goes to your phone. I understand like for you, for example, at the box, you've got your Google phone or whatever it is, et cetera. But really, if someone DMs you, they tweet at you, they shoot your face, it's all the same. It's all going, to, what's the difference? Somewhere along the way, we've thought because it's my number, it's more private. I mean, I, there's a whole separate discussion that the idea of privacy is silly at this point. I mean, if you think you have privacy, you are delusional at best. Right. So that's my point. I mean, and it's so simple. If, if, if you did give out my phone number and I was getting crazy texts, I'd just delete it. Or, you know, so what's the difference? I mean, first of all, let's talk in, in reality. If I did put your phone number out there, nobody's calling you. <laughs> <laughs> the, there, there's not going to be this horde of Ackermanites that are gonna are gonna swarm you with uh, you know messages of praise and and love voicemails. It's just not happening as much as you would like to think. You never the know. six people the six people that bought your book might text you. First of all, I've sold seven officially now. Seven <laughs> books have been Fair. sold. Fair enough. Anyway. One of them, your mom doesn't count. She can call you whenever she wants. She bought five of them. <laughs> giving them out to all her friends. And uh, my mom did reach out at one point. She was like, can I have a copy of your book? I was like, yeah, it's on Amazon, mom. Yeah, oh. it's 13 bucks. <laughs> Don't be cheap. Support your son. Oh, so, anyway, back in 2007, CrossFit was this dingy garage gym type thing. And I still think, you know, you and I, when we did our dropping in series, which by the way, people forget. It's on our YouTube channel, Best Hour of the Day. 10 episodes of dropping in. But when we did that, one of the things we'd often show up and be like, oh, this is re- really reminiscent. This reminds me of old school CrossFit. Now, I think there's pros and cons to that. And what we want to discuss t- today is the impact of professionalization on CrossFit as a whole, but specifically the affiliates and the, the, the box owners. I mean, Back in the day, it, we were at Albany CrossFit to circa 2008, 9, 10. It was basically Animal House with working out. For sure. I think I mean, there... I'm not saying you were there and you know it, but that's just even level, even seminars were way different i mean it was no i mean i mean i was there and i am i am aware but my point is there i think there's 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 two like what we what you and i are referring to specifically in a lot of those dropping in episodes was just look and feel of the boxes is very nostalgic of of the and seven you know because the obviously coaching has gotten better you know people have gotten better technically you know, there's a certain population of, of affiliates that have uh, advanced by large margins from this standpoint. Um, but the the gyms is probably what has probably made the most measurable leap as a whole, which is it kind of understands that a, 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 a dingy, grungy, musty, gross gym isn't cool anymore. It never really was. It never really was cool, to be honest. It, ju- it was just new 
and nobody knew any better. I don't know because I think what, when I grew up, I, I, you know, my first job at Club Fit and that was my first gym was, it was your very shiny, you know, pool, hot tub, racquetball courts, et cetera. And then just got used to it. And then, you know, went to college and Gold's gyms were clean, but I worked at a gym called New Physique and it was like, where are these gyms that you worked at, dude? Albany, New York, New Physique. It was a, next door to a Quiznos. So, of course, in college, I would work out and then I would go to Quiznos. I don't even a foot long sandwich. Yeah. But I would get a like grilled chicken with cheese and, you know, thinking I'm eating healthy. Meanwhile, I'm eating, it, you know, I did 15 minutes of cardio, sir. I will have one foot of bread. Thank you. Exactly. exactly. Um, and, and for good measure, throw a, a lot of blue cheese on there. Yeah. So I, would, I would get grilled chicken with wing sauce and blue cheese. And it was like my way of getting healthy wings. I was like, oh, this is really good for you. It's not a wing, but it tastes like one. I was like, toast that bread up. So it's, you know, like fried anyway. But it was, you know, a little bit dingier. And then I got a job at an old school YMCA and it was just dirty. Like you, the, the weight portion was in the basement and it was like old school weights. None of them matched. They were rusty. And I think because I grew up watching like the Arnold Schwarzenegger in Venice Beach and working out on the beach, you're just kind of like, okay, this is cool. Like this is, this is what a gym should feel like. So when, when CrossFit came about and you would watch old age, I mean, look at the old HQ videos, or I don't even know if you would call it HQ, but basically, you know, Glassman and Santa Cruz with Amundsen and Annie and Nicole, you know, whether you're watching Nasty Girls or GI Jane, you're just like this idea that you can get really fit and in great shape anywhere was cool. Yeah, I, I, no, 100%. I think, I think what's always been cool, you know, to a, to a, a fringe group, if you will, is like the, this idea of like hard work. And I'll be, admittedly, I think that, that fringe group is actually getting smaller, not bigger. Um, but that, that was the cool part. I don't think gross is cool. I don't think gross has ever been cool. It was just overshadowed by, hey, this is like, this is where you go to like legit work hard. Like, you know, because I can't do that at a regular gym because they don't either have the equipment. It's, it, they don't have some of these, you know, kind of specialty pieces of equipment. Um, there's not the, the group of people who are getting after it, you, you know, you know, you think of like, I've never been to Westside. I've seen a lot of videos of Westside and pictures and photos and stuff like that. And Westside is cool, but I don't think it's cool because it's clean. You know, it's cool because of what happens in there. That's why it's cool. And that's where, that's where CrossFit became cool because there was something happening and still is in CrossFit affiliates that was not happening anywhere else. That's what made it cool. But don't you think there's some sort of correlation there between, hmm, how do I say this? Willingness to like, just for me, for example, start a gym in a racquetball court with no flooring and piece together equipment and your willingness to, you know, it's, it's kind of like risk tolerance, you know, I'm, I'm diving into the crypto world, you know, and I, and I talked to you about it and a couple other buddies and it's, it's, it's very reminiscent to me of CrossFit back in 2006, seven, where it's like, oh, is this going to stick around? Is this worth it? You know, it, the risk is, you know, in this case, money versus injury or, you know, all those things. And I think this, it's like taking a genius you take Coach Glassman, who many people will say is a genius, and then also say, hey, there's some crazy there. And, you know, it's, it's that idea of can you have one without the other? Can, can you have a shiny, spotless CrossFit, but also have the magic of CrossFit? Because I think yeah. it gets lost the a answer little is bit. Yeah. I think the answer is yes. Yeah, I agree I, with actually, you. The answer is actually, yes. Actually, I know the answer is yes. I agree. And, 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 and that is what I think should be the goal. That's my personal opinion. Like my, well, my why does it to, like you have a really beautiful box. Cross and Rife is. I mean, I don't know. Sometimes I want to. Sometimes I want to blow it up. Like it's as good as it's going to get. I'm in a warehouse, right? Like there's some things I could do to spruce it up, but I, I do think it is nicer and bigger than a lot of gyms. Now there's some other gyms like make me feel inadequate as a man, right? Like that's that's a real thing, um, you know. Would love to have those, but I would not love to have them at the expense of like doing hard work. For, for like, what would you what would you add to your box right now? What would you change? 
the, the building is just really old. Right. Like really old, and there's like a lot of shitty parts to it. So the thing I can do about that, like that, that's that's not going to incur to like paint the ceilings and do some other stuff. Done a ton of stuff over the, the what, eleven years we've been in this facility uh, with expansions and adding things. Like it's cool, but it's as cool as it's gonna get. You know? But that's an interesting thought because that's probably a big reason when CrossFit first came about that they were opening in these you know rundown and dirty places where a they're cheaper so yeah i can get a warehouse for significantly cheaper and then you know when you think about rundown it was like well you could there wasn't rogue like nowadays if you go to rogue your gym naturally looks better because it's cleaner equipment it's you know the design layout of it is beautiful all that you know it matches etc so but i but i think yeah like when I opened in 2007, when you opened in what, 2009, it, it's almost like you're forced to be still in, in that kind of like, hey, this is a dirty thing because that's the only way you're going to get that many square footage in, in nice areas. I mean, when, when, oh, when I, yeah, my, I mean, my third box was really, you know, it was as close as you can get to a global gym. But then again, I think naturally CrossFits will look like that simply because it isn't machine based. It's just a floor. Like while the equipment's off the floor, you basically you right. walk in. If you were new, you'd be like, "Oh, they have a few rowers. They've got this big contraption in the middle, mm -hmm. and then they've got uh, a lot of rubber matting." Right. So obviously, there's tangible things in there regard to why most gyms look the way they do. Number one, cost. It's cheaper to get in the warehouse, and number two, layout. It's really hard to get. A a, a very blank canvas in retail spaces in a warehouse it's it's intentionally open because it's not it's just used for storage in most instances like or or some sort of like factory type setting so those are the two things that lend themselves to what crossfit facilities want and need to have in their facilitate crossfit it's like i need rigs uh, i need things mounted to the wall i need a lot of open floor space so we can have barbells and all that kind of stuff so those are the two big things however you know, having done for a while, I would absolutely prefer to have something, you know, minus the equipment that when you walk in, my first thought is that, man, this really looks nice. This place is nice. Like this place is, is almost bougie, but like without the bougie at it, right? Like it's, nice, but this still says work, which is kind of like how I would describe rogue in general. Like their stuff is nice, but it, but it's built for and based on its utility. Yeah, you know, which is kind of like a visually that you would want in a CrossFit gym. It's like I would want all the things of, you know, a cycle, like all of very nice, flashy stuff, minus all of bikes and stuff is, you know, not really that useful. Just like replace it with equipment that we would use barbell, sandbags, pull up rig, all that kind of stuff, ropes. Yeah, it kind of like reminds me, you, you can see that in the car world, like a Jeep. Like Jeeps aren't right. cheap. They're super functional, but they also are like to, to the right eye. If you're a Jeep fan, they look right. super, like you said, bougie. And the same goes with a CrossFit. I think it's one of those things where because we are experienced, the listeners are experienced, they can walk in. And, you know, a great example, we used it recently from our dropping in series, that Hayes Barton box that was super small, so, right. you know, but nice rig. You walk in and you're like, and that was in like, the prime, you know, what do they call it? Like the five corners or something? Yeah, something like that. You know, so like five downtown. points maybe. And, yeah. you know, it reminds me even of like yoga studios. Like you don't have to be this huge space. It can be this nice tiny area. And, but you can make it look yeah, clean. It's like, I think we were just like, that was like a speakeasy of store prior to that. Right. It was like a ball prior to that or something like that, which was cool, you know? And you say the same thing in bars. Like you can have this bar that you have to walk down like a creaky flight of stairs and there's cobwebs and then you open up the doors and it's like a beautiful neon sign and they've got top of you know top shelf whiskey so that you know you can have that but let's let's talk about this do we think that crossfit is now going too far and you know there's this term of you know turn pro and professionalization and be the ceo all of those types of things is that ultimately good for crossfit or is this going to be detrimental you know it's it's when I, when you first start crossfit you know you and i both dave matthews band fans like i saw dave play for 
2,000 people in upstate New York. And then a year later, I had to you know, buy tickets to sit on a lawn amongst 30,000 people. And I think people right. felt the same way about CrossFit. Like, I kind of want to tell my buddy about it, but I also don't want this to explode because I'm enjoying this. Do we think ultimately this professionalization is good or bad for, for affiliate owners for, and for coaches? I think everything works. It just depends on how you do it. So if you could still play in a speakeasy and it would be very limited and the people that would want that pay out the nose for it. And then there's other people who just want to sit in the lawn. And then there's people like me who started sitting in the lawn and then they're like, I want to sit in the box seats. I want to pay the $300 VIP ticket, go, you know, in the bar and hang out and sit down and be close and do all that stuff. And, you know, so, no, but to your point, Yes, I think the professionaliz the professionalization of CrossFit is not only good, but I genuinely believe that it will reverse the, the general thoughts and 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 frame the conversation around wellness. Hopefully, and I think Jim should move in that direction. Yeah, However, uh, go well, ahead. You know, something you said that's interesting. It's like yeah, and and there's nothing wrong with along the way just deciding hey. You know, and, and that's how I was with Dave Matthews, for example. I'd be like, cool, I'll spend 500 bucks for front row tonight. Like, you know, you you you, you ultimately attract a different audience, I guess, is, is one way to look at it, right? You know, you know we, we preach. That, yeah, that's the beauty of the affiliate model is I can choose to do either or. I can build the 30,000 uh, seat arena or I could do it in a speakeasy. I could do it in a, you know, in a to a crowd of 200. And, and you will get the people that are looking for both of those experiences, like who don't want to pay $300, who want to pay $65 for lawn seats and, and, and smuggle, you know, Jack Daniels in their pants. That yeah, I, I definitely never did, but the, you know, so, you don't have a but flask? the point, you have a flask? I, have a, I have a, I have a lot of flasks. My wife has flasks too. We, we have, yeah. we have matching flasks. The, um, so, but here, here's, here's more to my point is currently, I think the great travesty of CrossFit in general is that there are very few professionals. If you think about the size of the CrossFit community, right? And then we pull out the people who make a living doing CrossFit, the percentage uh, is, I don't, I don't believe it's anything to be proud of. Really? Right? And this is, this is not a shot at anybody, right? So this is this, I'm not blaming anybody. This is not like I poo poo in CrossFit. I'm not, I think it was an unintended consequence that nobody could have possibly predicted. And I, and which is why I'm so adamant about this, about what we do with affiliate you, because I don't think there is an overwhelming population of people who earn a living as professionals coaching CrossFit. There's box. And I mean, even that population is, largely underwater with regard to affiliate ownerships and making the money they want and, and doing the things they want to do and then hiring other people and coaching stuff like that. So that, you know, after what are we 20 years into this roughly 2002 first wow. box. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we're, we're coming up so, on 20 years of CrossFit. I mean, yeah, 20, 20 years, years. Yeah. 20 years of, of like of affiliate 20, 20 years of affiliates. Right. So like, I think, so uh, yeah, 2002. So I have that t-shirt from, uh, from TJ Cooper from CrossFit East. It has 2002 on it. So that I think is the great travesty, which we need to fix because TJ Cooper on the show, by the way, we do need to get TJ Cooper on the show. Um, need to go shoot some guns with that dude too. But the, but that I think is, is currently the great travesty and why CrossFit has not grown to be the, just industry leader across the board that when we think about, Hey, what is the best protocol with which to get people fit, make sure it's for longevity, increase health and wellness, have good conversations about nutrition and, you know, train people to use their bodies functionally. Like we all know that there is no better protocol than CrossFit, but why are not more people earning a living? Why are, why are there not like just massive stables of coaches that work in profitable gym that are earning a living, changing people's lives? It's kind of weird when you say it out loud. It's just like, I'm changing. Like, why would there not be an overwhelming group of people in a profession that literally changes people's lives, that saves lives, that reverses the tides of chronic disease that we have in the United States? 
I'll why? Tell you. I think I think it's multifaceted, but the question is something we should be asking ourselves every day. Like, why the fuck is that the case? You you want the answer because I have it. Give it to me, bro. Okay, I'm gonna tell you why. But first, we should do a shout out to Doc Spartan. Man, you like how I did that? I I'd love to, don't. A cliffhanger. Like right now, the <laughs> listeners are like, oh, I, I don't. I'm gonna drop a knowledge bomb, which I am. I'm I'm so aggravated that what I would do right now is if I had my Doc Spartan eye eye savior bomb, I would be rubbing it underneath my eyes so that I would stop squinting you so angrily right now because I, that shit is that stuff is legit. It's like coffee for your eyeballs. For your eyes, so much younger looking than mine right now. Look at my eyes. Right. Look old. Look, I look like I'm eighty ish. You right. definitely look at least fifty two. Those bags underneath your eyes, those are rough. So you should buy some. I have it. It's great. It literally smells like coffee as well. Well, I got the coffee scrub too, which I don't know. I should ask Dale about this, but I'm nervous to use it at night because I'm afraid it'll wake me up. I don't know if that's true. Meaning the caffeine, just inhaling the caffeine. Inhaling it, like putting it in your skin is ingesting it, right? Uh, I don't know if it's ingesting it. I think it will be absorbed. I think that's the wrong use of the term ingesting, but yeah, the... Uh, probably the um yeah so that however i do i do agree with you so this is rare wait about, I do agree with you about about sex panther it does smell great you look i mean you look younger you I, there's a lot i got a lot of things going i yeah I, there's a lot of things going for me i got some sun i got some good vitamin d i trained twice this month you're gonna so be younger than your things, kids things are on the up and up i spent 50 minutes in the sauna today just sauna already mentally punishing myself what's that sauna is an evening thing for me uh it's not happening in the evening for me so in the morning i prefer to do it i prefer to do it in the morning it like really kind of resets my brain but how long um, do you do? but yeah i did 50 minutes today at 148 Wait, 5 0 you say uh 150, yeah, 150 at uh, no, 50 minutes at 148 degrees. 15 or 50? One, uh, so five zero. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I try to do, if I'm going to get in the song, especially because mine's in the basement, I got to turn it on and everything. I try to go 40. Well, it's usually on. There's a couple of folks that hop in in the 6 a.m. So it's usually is on. Good for an infrared. One, oh, yeah. I mean, it's regularly goes to 158, 157 here, which if I want to feel like I'm like a mental toddler, like just weak. Then I'll go and I'll get in there and I will like today, the last 10 minutes, I was like struggle bus. I was like, I was like sitting on the bench, like just like hands on my knees, just like, like just couldn't do anything other than just like stare at the clock and be like, make five more minutes, make five more minutes. I'm going to get a barrel sauna too, I think here. Cause it gets a little hotter. I think they have different. No, it gets a lot hotter. You can push over 200 degrees in a barrel. Yeah. Sauna. But you don't, you don't hang like the infrared. You're in there for quite some time. I actually, Try to do like yeah, my, you might do 10, 15 minutes in a barrel sauna at what any given point. Yeah, I do like a little my I try to do my meditation in the sauna. I try yeah. to get bang for my buck. So buy, anyway. Buy uh, buy doc buy doc Spartan. Use, use our code. Best hour. 15 best hour. So no, give, if you're watching the, if you're watching this YouTube video, don't let my eyes be any indication of Doc Spartan. Well, you need the eye stuff, dude. You have the eye stuff. I'm, you, but I also have a. You got to use it. It's like uh, having a barbell. You don't get stronger if you don't I'm actually not lift every weights. Morning, but I got a, I got a three month old, and, and the truth be told, I had. I'll, I'll give you the truth. You want the truth? Listen, I got, I got two kids, dude. I don't know what you're talking about. Except, you know, I live in Colorado. I, I took a little too much of my, my sleepy time. Pill last right. night. Yeah. I think that's yeah, actually right. what's causing yeah. these yeah. eyes. I might have overdid it. The sleepy time yeah. pill. Yeah. So anyway, okay. Back what to seriousness. Takes. What do you? What do you? What do you think is the issue? I'm gonna tell you what it is. It takes balls. That's what it is. And I'm gonna explain myself. No one, as you're growing up when you're a kid, is like, hey, maybe one day you're gonna be a coach and you're gonna help people change their lives, like. You'll be a doctor, you'll be a lawyer, you'll be a teacher, you'll be a nurse. Like there's all of these professions out there. And no one says like my parents to this day, I'll be 43 in a couple of weeks. When are you getting a real job? Meanwhile, I've made more money in my career than any of my parents. One was a doctor, a, a dentist. Like he, he made good money, don't get me wrong. 
and he sold his practice and his land that he owned, my father I'm talking about. So he probably did pretty well. But my mother was a teacher. My stepfather, you know, had a job for, I believe he worked for like Prodigy back in the day, AT&T, my stepmother, et cetera. Like, and they're still questioning. I'm like, I've wrote, I've written a book, mom. Like, you know, go buy it on Amazon. Like I've, I've, we, we coach dozens, hundreds of people. Like I've traveled the world doing this thing. I've owned half a dozen or more businesses. You know, the, I think that's the big disconnect. Like people don't equate this is professional and this can be, it, it's not at the point yet. People look at you, me, and, and a handful of others out there in this space as the minority. And until that shifts to, hey, that's an option, I can achieve that as well. It will continue to be, well, you know, this is a transitional job or, you know, you can do this out of college, but eventually you'll need to get a real job. You know, it, I, I, I truly think that's, that's what it is. And, and that's kind of like, yes, it needs to, but I don't think, I don't think it requires professionalization. If anything, I, you know, I think it, it, it potentially requires less because you need people like you and me, and I'm not trying to be cocky or arrogant, but you need people like us that are just like, hey, we are unapologetic, unapologetically who we are. And because those are the people that are going to make big changes in this world, right? Like you and I read a lot. We listen to a lot of self-help books and biographies. Like none of them are like, okay, then I went to high school and then I graduated college in four years. And then I went on to my postdoc degree. It's all, it's always like I dropped out of college and started this firm or I did this and that. Like those are the people that are going to make waves and make changes. And I think for the listeners, like it has to be scary. It has to have that risk reward. And, and you have to be willing to put in the work. I mean, I graduated college in 2000 and it wasn't until at least 2009, probably 10, that I felt confident in how much money. I mean, I was really, you know, I, I wasn't struggling. I wasn't on the streets, but I mean, driving old cars, living in the ghettos, like living in basement apartments. Eventually I bought a house, you know, way smaller than, you know, anyone desires their home to be back in the day, you know, the, but it was something, it was just like a, a, a dream that I never gave up on. And I think that's really what it comes down to. If, if you want to be successful, you have to be willing to take that risk and you have to be willing, you know, to, to put it all on the line and, and go against the grain. What do you think? I agree with all of that. And I would, I would add one more thing to that, which is I, I really, and this is why I think people gravitate towards, this podcast to be honest with you i think people should be way more honest about what affiliate ownership is like the number of people that i talk to and that, that you and i have both talked to and it's like listen shit is hard it's going to be stressful what you are about to embark on might be the hardest thing you've ever done and they're like ah it's going to be fun and then a weekend being on a phone call with somebody crying. They're just like, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm like, I told you. Now, that's not to scare anybody away. I don't want anybody to be scared. I, I think, you know, there's a, there's a quote that Joe Rogan likes to reference. And it, it, it's really been rattling around in my brain for a long time. Most men lives, live lives of quiet desperation. Most and men live lives of quiet desperation. I like that. And what, gets me fired up is I think the current state of affiliate ownership, and I'm just going to fucking say it is like, I think most affiliate owners live a life of quiet desperation and that needs to change. And the first way to change it is having a conversation and being very upfront be like, Hey, shit is hard. If you want to run a profitable business, you got to be good at a lot of stuff and it's going to take a while. And you probably need to get somebody to teach you how to do that shit be sleepless nights. You're going to cut checks that you are not sure are really going to go out there. You're going to hire people that you regret hiring and then have to fire them. You're going to deal with shitty clients. You're going to have to get up at 5 a.m. or earlier and then go to bed or get home at 8 p.m. And you might have to do that for six months to a year. However, if you do that and you continue to improve your skill set and you continue to put in the work and you continually need to just like, you know, like wide gap, make a little improvement here, make a little improvement there. You will come out on the other side. That pain will end and you will have something that is so tremendous and supporting that I couldn't possibly be you. Like it's, I couldn't put it in words. The words don't exist for it. 
but I want people to have a more honest conversation about that. And just be like, Hey, open up your affiliate. And if you build it, they will come. No, that is not how it works. You know, hard, but it is rewarding. Yeah. And I think that, you know, would be building on what I said is exactly what you said. And part of it is, you know, I, only using myself as an example, it was like, okay, not only am I, you know, I guess you're like betting on yourself to some extent, you know, you, you're, you're just saying, okay, I believe in this thing and I'm going to ride it. You know, the, the period of 2000 to 2007 for me, it would have been so much easier. I had a master's degree to go be a teacher, to go be a social worker. And, you know, while I guess I was hedging my bets, like continuing to stay in school, I always looked at it as like, yeah, it's a backup plan, but you have to be willing to, to bet on yourself. And then here's the other thing that you've done well, that I've done well, that if you look at the generation of people that came on seminar staff when we did, you know, that 2000, uh, you know, pre-2012, 13 era, you know, who've been on for eight, 10 years, here's what it was. It was those people that not only bet on themselves, but man, we put in the work to get better and constantly improved. I mean, when I didn't have any money, I flew to California to take my level two, right? When I didn't have any money, I remember traveling up and down the East Coast, taking every specialty seminar I could, which then led me to working with Coach Ripito, which then led me to interning on set, you know? So it's, it's not only just like you have to have balls, but you have to have balls and you have to bet on yourself and you have to put in the work. And, and this goes back to what you're saying, like, you, you, you have to be, you know, understanding, hey, this isn't going to be, you're not choosing the easy path, but. And you are going to lose. At I, don't, I mean, I just don't know how to say that. Like you are going to lose. You, there will be some ideas that will fall flat. There'll be things you think are going to make money that will absolutely not, it will cost you money. There'll be times when you will not make the money that, that you think and that you think your entire world view of how things work. Like all that shit is real. And losing and doesn't mean only money, right? I mean, I lost, I mean, friends, friends, I, I, there, you know, here's a, here's an interesting story. And he's to this day, one of my best friends, I was the best man at his wedding. He was the best man at my wedding. We, you know, went to college together, 2000, it must've been like 2008. We were all turning 30 and he had this huge party in New York and I happened to be in New York, but I was interning at a seminar. And we went out to dinner with Coach Glassman and Chuck Carswell was there and I didn't make it to his party. And he got really upset with me. And it was a decision I had to make. Like, this is good for, like, I don't know that it was right or wrong, but it was good for my career. I mean, to this day, when I speak to Coach Glassman, we reference that dinner because it was just an amazing, Pat Sherwood was there, E.C. Simcal. It was like, the, who's, Bosman was there, David Osorio, super fancy freaking restaurant in Brooklyn. But point is like, you, you have to be willing to make those decisions. I, mean, I, how many relationships that I was in ended, how many like, friendships that I lost, like, not seeing family on holidays, et cetera. And, and you have to be willing to take those risks. So losing doesn't only look fine. I mean, losing was stress. We talked about it when, recently when members would leave and I would freak out, you know, there's, there's so many ups and downs, but never wavering, never changing your mind. And I think that was it. You know, my mentor used to say, you know, being an entrepreneur doesn't mean you own your own business. It simply means you're taking responsibility for your life. And if you're listening to this and you're a level one coach or two or, or you know, three or four for that matter, I mean, yeah, there's no fours. I'm the only four, let's be honest. But, you know, <laughs> if you're a level three, like Fern, like give yourself something to shoot for. But the, the point is, you know, that, that is being an entrepreneur, not going about, you know, getting a job at AT&T like my stepfather did saying, hey, I'm going to go to this gym. And I mean, when I was before CrossFit, every day I would drive 50 miles coaching at three or four gyms, Pilates and yoga and this and that. That's the life of an entrepreneur. And it's, it's not for everyone. It's not for the faint of heart. And, and, and I don't... <clears throat> I don't want to have this conversation to scare the shit out of people. Like I don't. Sure, you should be like you should be scared. You shouldn't go into this like you said. Too many people. I'm gonna. It's like crypto. I'm gonna put some money in crypto and I'm gonna be a millionaire tomorrow. No, there's gonna be ups and downs. And it's you know and and it's well, if, you'd game, if you'd have bought GameStop, you might be. But speaking of, I was looking at GameStop again yeah. today. Like, but but I, I I see where you're going, which is like you have to be able to you have to be willing to 
you have to be willing to put yourself out there. You have to be willing to lose. You have to be willing to stay up all night and, you know, give up your weekends to work on the facility and get your ass up early and put in extra work and deal with people's shitty attitudes and, you know, deal with human resources issues with like the coach has an issue with a client and you got to go talk to both of them about that and, and, and be, you know, uh, a life coach that you're not qualified to be like all those things are real. And all I want people to do is approach it without rose colored lenses on. I want you to look at this very real, which is like, this is hard, right? It's hard, but at the same time, what are we doing with our time here? If we're not pursuing something that is hard to achieve, like collectively, just as people, human beings roaming this earth, what are we doing? Like, if you're not, a, if you're not, if you are not pursuing something worth having that has that impacts society, then again, I do think that falls in that, that, that life of quiet desperation. You know, I feel, I think affiliate owners are in a, are in a unique version of that, which is they do that because they want to do, they want the impact, but then they get stuck in this martyrdom and they don't know what to do and, and how to break out of that so that they can have greater impact. You know, the, the number of phrases that you hear out there is like, I don't want to make money. I don't want a 300 person gym. Like, I just want to be able to do just this. And I'm like, those are all people selling themselves short and fooling themselves. Don't you think they're doing it to protect their ego? It, it, it's a lie that we tell ourselves for any number of reasons, which is the substitute for, I don't know how to do this. Yeah. I've told myself that lie in, I don't know, 100 million different variations. And then, you know, I'm reading the four, the four agreements right now. And it's just like uh, the simplicity, the simplicity of that book that it just like, if you just use those things, you know, but be impeccable with your word, be impeccable with your world. Don't think, don't take things personally. Um, do your best. And why am I blanking on the third one? Fourth one. No, do your best is the fourth one, but I can't remember what the, the, okay. the third one. I'm going to look it up. Here we go. Here but we go. Um, what is the main? Anyway, but there, there's the simplicity of there, which is like when you're talking about be impeccable word, they're not just, they're not referring to just be impeccable with your word with other people. They're talking about be impeccable with your word with yourself. Like, don't lie to yourself. What are the agreements that you have with yourself? Don't make assumptions. Don't make assumptions is the third one. Yeah. So. And again, all of these fit into this conversation they're having is just like, be impeccable with your word. Like if you're going to do this, like tell yourself that you're really going to do it. You're not going to do it half-ass. You're not going to, you know, you're not going to plan to keep this other job forever because then I'm never making the leap. You know, I'm not going to take things personally when the shit goes wrong or the landlord is mean to me or my clients leave or my coach doesn't want to work there anymore. Then they leave to start their own gym, you know, and don't make assumptions about what you do or don't know. Learn, educate yourself. And then all of that is wrapped up with do your best because you don't have all the answers. You're going to fail. You're going to fall down. It's going to be difficult. It's going to hurt. It's going to hurt your emotions. You're going to have to go through some, through some growth stages where you leave people behind because they are not ready to make that journey with you. All of that is part of the battle. And if I keep all of that in context and say, listen, I've got a goal. I want to do this. I want to impact people's lives. I want to give other people the opportunity to impact people's lives. What do I need to do in order to make that happen? well, I need to learn some shit. And I don't know exactly what it is, but I'm going to go find out, right? Maybe it's about business. Maybe it's about training. Maybe it's about sales. Maybe it's about social media. I don't know. Here's the newsflash. It's all those things at different phases during your development. And I just want people to be more realistic about that conversation because this is how we get past that. This is how we pull affiliate owners out of this quiet life of desperation where they don't know what to do. And it's just like, well, you know, I just really like having the gym. And I'm like, you know what you'd really love more? your gym crushing it and having an awesome staff and you being able to do the things you want to and be able to help more people. That's what you'd really love. And don't fool yourself into thinking you won't because you would, I promise you, I've met people like that. And I'm like, that's what I want. I want to help more people. I want to do the things that I want to do. I want to provide more opportunity. I, I want to pass on knowledge. Dude, I love it. It's getting me fired up. Another quote that I think about often, and I think it kind of goes along with this is, the unexamined life is not worth living by Socrates. And I think a lot of what we're saying is that it's just like, I love the four agreements. I think it's a great book, by the way, I highly recommend it. And just thinking about what Socrates says, I think for so many people, it, it, going back to my statement, you know, what, what is it? It's like, it takes balls. It's 
I mean, this is a whole nother, you know, tangent and topic, but it's just, we grow up in this world where it's like, do this, do this, do this. And being an affiliate owner or any sort of CrossFit coach or, or any coach for that matter is really against the grain of society. And it was just, I mean, I'm not going to say I'm like this, uh, you know, unicorn that, you know, always went against the grain and conformity, et cetera. Like I definitely wasn't that person, but when it came to work, I, for some reason, just always in my heart and head was like, this is like a big chunk of my life. I only want to do things that I enjoy doing. And yes, you know, we, we talk about time and place and I got lucky CrossFit came in and that idea of chase excellence by coach Glassman and the money will follow. Like I believed in it, you know, head down and now look where we are all these years later. But I think for those listening, I hope that they realize like, let's assume you get a good night's sleep and you sleep eight hours a day and you have 16 left, 50% or more of that is at work. I mean, and that's not including your commute and all that stuff. Like I can't imagine spending 50% of my life doing something I don't enjoy. I mean, look, it's bad enough that two hours of my week are spent with you recording these podcasts. Imagine if the rest of them were spent doing other things I didn't enjoy. I would go further than that and imagine taking something that brings you so much joy that you, that you got into because it inspired you so much that then turns into something that brings you so much fear and stress and pain. I don't, I can't think of anything worse than that. Right. Be the, Hey, I, this was this thing. And then I, because of my own beliefs or whatever's going on in there, it, it morphs into this thing that I dread. I was thinking about this morning. I got to the gym. I was just like more than average fired up today, like in a good way. Like I walked in, I walked in and I was just like sprinkling people with good vibes. Like there's just like, you know, oddly enough, you guys don't know, like I'm the happy person. Jay is Mr. Downer. Like that's just the way it works. In private. And right. And I was thinking about it. It's just like, I fucking love my job. Like I can't, I, I cannot imagine doing anything else. I'm like, I get to walk in here and I get to work with people that want to be here and give a shit about their health. And I have awesome staff who are like, not just great people, but really fucking good at what they do. And then I get to turn around and, you know, have like a subpar host for this podcast that I get to pull along with me. And then I get to talk to affiliate owners and like help them through that journey. I'm like, yeah, I'm good. This is great. Yeah, like Ross, like yesterday, for example, unique day, but I ran a level one webinar and then I coached for three hours and I got home and my brain was a little fried. Like I've been talking to people online in person, but it was like this weird energy. Like I just, you feel good. Your job, when you leave, whether it's shutting down your computer at home, if you're virtual or get in your car and drive home, I would say you should feel good. Like what other thing do you do for six, seven, eight hours a day that leaves you feeling bad after. I can't wait to get back to the gym. Yeah, I mean, That's I, why I spend it. so much time here. It's a running joke between my wife and I. she's like, when are you coming home? I'm like, I've been leaving in five minutes. She's like, I'll see you in two hours. And I'm like, you're probably right. You know, like that happens all the time. And I'm not, so I, I want to be very clear about why I'm bringing this up. Very clear. I am not bringing this up to be like, I'm so awesome. I'm bringing this up because if you're listening to this, I've been the other guy where I do not want to go to the gym, where I want to burn that thing down, when I want to opt out of my lease and just pay the tens of thousands of dollars to just leave it all behind and not deal with things. And I hate my coaching staff and all of the other stuff. But I left that. And that's what I want people to move to. Like, you do not have to live that life. You do not have to live this life of quiet desperation as a martyr feeling good because you taught a couple people the air squat. It can be so much more. The problem is you're going to have to make a leap. It's going to have to happen. You're going to have to make a decision and, I don't know, sell your car or do something and invest it back into the gym or make that hire that you don't want to make. You're going to have to make that leap. And it might not work out the first time. But if you keep trying eventually you will sort it out. That's what I want people thinking about because that is how CrossFit explodes to what it actually should be based on what we all know it can do, which is change lives. That's what I want people to do. And it's hard, but again, shit that is hard is really worth pursuing. 
so you never miss an episode of the podcast. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and on all major podcasting platforms at Best Hour of Their Day. Thank you so much for tuning in and for being a part of the best hour of our day. See you next time.